Hi everyone and welcome to the closing session of ESMAConf 2023. We hope that you've enjoyed this week as much as we have. It's been such an interesting set of presentations, workshops, tutorials and panel discussions and um, it's been really fascinating. It's been so interesting to see all these talks and, um, and I really hope that you've enjoyed them as much as I have. Um, I also wanted to mainly spend this final session just saying thank you. Uh, a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in, uh, whether you're watching this live or uh, in catch up maybe later during this week or the week after the conference, or maybe you're just catching up uh, later this year in 2023 or in the future. Um, thank you so much for um, coming along and taking part. Uh, it wouldn't be the same without you. Um, I also just wanted to go through some of the numbers again. I think in the end we ended up with 27 presentations, six special sessions, 10 workshops, nine panel discussions, 59 tutorials, and more than 150 organizers and presenters. Just take that in. That's a huge amount of effort, a huge number of people who've provided uh, in excess of 50 hours of presentations. Um, that's a huge collective effort. Uh, and it's really going a long way to help make um, your lives as evidence synthesists or meta-analysists easier by increasing access, accessibility, and uh, understanding of tools and frameworks related to evidence synthesis and meta-analysis, much of which um, is related to working in R. So this, uh, as with the last couple of years of ESMAConf, represents a huge amount of effort. Um, it really can't uh, overestimate um, and, and thank enough um, all of the people who've been involved. That includes a huge team of people who've uh, helped in some way in the organizing team. Thank you so much to all of you. This wouldn't have happened without you. Um, and also thanks to our workshop organizers. Um, all of these people have worked together to provide between 90 minutes and uh, up to, I think, uh, six or more hours in the case of Wolfgang um, in workshops. These um, interactive workshops have required a huge amount of planning and effort. So thank you so, so much. Um, we uh, really are excited about this um, really important resource that's available. Uh, and our workshop from last year, uh, you'll remember from uh, Alison Bethel is one of the most accessed videos from ESMRConf 2022. So we know that um, this much more expanded program that we've been able to provide this year, thanks to all of this um, group's efforts, is going to continue to be really, really popular. So um, if you haven't checked out these workshops yet, then please do. Um, and if you have, um, I hope you will join me in uh, sending some virtual thanks. And if you do want to join in on Twitter, and, and express your thanks, then these are the people to tag and say thank you to. Um, I also wanted to thank again our funders. We're still provided with funding from Code for Science and Society this year that helped us to provide bursaries uh, for caregiver and resource constraint support. So thanks um, to that final pot of money that we've been able to spend this year. And to our donors, we've had donors over the last year or so, and all of you who registered and were kind enough to provide a financial uh, donation during registration. It's um, a really huge amount of support and it just goes to uh, make next year uh, as accessible and um, equitable as possible. So a huge thanks. If you've appreciated this year and didn't um, donate when you registered, um, please do feel free to donate again. You can visit opencollective.com slash esmaconf and um, provide a donation there. If you want to register again, but provide a donation, you can do that anytime. Registration will remain open um, throughout the year. Uh, and that will then provide you with an invoice that you can claim back to provide um, institutional financial support if you want to and you have the budget for that. But thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to sort of end up by uh, talking about ESMAConf 2024. Um, I do think ESMAConf 2024 is going to happen. It's been a huge amount of effort to get ESMAConf 2023 um, out, 
but I think we're still keen. So um, it's going to be happening in spring 2024, most likely. So keep an eye out for announcements over the summer with more presentations, more workshops, hopefully more tutorials and maybe more people getting engaged as well. Um, only time will tell. But if you found it enjoyable, then please do spread the word and help us to uh, grow the family of EsmaConf even more. We want to see more of everything, basically. So um, we will also be sending out a survey to everybody who's registered to ask you uh, what you think we could do better uh, or what you liked as well um, to get feedback so that we can continually improve. If you want to provide specific anonymous feedback, then you can do that by following this link, bit.ly slash esmaconf underscore feedback. Um, as I said, please consider donating. And if you want to, you can join the EsmaConf team. You can find us on Twitter at ESHackathon and send us a DM or um, tag us in a message if you're keen to get involved. You can send us an email at um, eshackathon at gmail.com or neilhadaway at gmail.com. And as I said before, spread the word. Please do remember that all of the recordings for the last three years uh, EsmaConf 2021, EsmaConf 2022 and this year are going to be fully online on our YouTube channel and free forever so you can watch those and catch up whenever you want. Uh, they'll also um, be added, the EsmaConf 2023 videos will be added to the database of videos on the EsmaConf website, that's esmaconf.org and you can find those and search across the videos either through the program or by searching for specific words in titles or abstracts. And you can filter different stages of review processes and different types of tools as well, and find all of our workshops, tutorials, panel discussions and presentations across all three years there. We'll be adding this year as soon as possible. So uh, do continue to use that resource if you wanna come back to it and find videos on a specific topic or a specific package uh, and spread the word as well um, Everybody is free to use those videos however they want. And finally, closing up the session and closing up EsmaConf is Eli Akul from the American University in Beirut Medical Center, who's going to be telling us a bit more about living systematic reviews. Over to you, Eli. Hello, my name is Eli Akul. I'm a professor of medicine at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. It is my real pleasure and honor to be presenting today at the 2023 ESMAR conference. The question I will be addressing is whether living evidence syntheses have delivered on their promise. I will try to make the case that yes, to some extent they did. However, uh, they could deliver on their full potential if we can improve their processes and their tools uh, while complying with the principles of open synthesis. I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. I do have some intellectual conflicts of interest related to some of the content I will be sharing today. So after uh, talking about the concept of living systematic reviews, I will review uh, the living systematic review work during the pandemic and end with discussion of challenges and potential solutions. In this 2017 paper, we discussed the why, what, when, and how of living systematic reviews. In terms of the what, uh, living systematic reviews are systematic reviews that are continually updated, incorporating relevant new evidence as it becomes available. You could tell from that definition that it's on the optimistic side, um, promising to continually update the search and incorporate the evidence as soon as it becomes available. Something we realized uh, after the pandemic experience that it's not as easy done as said. In terms of the when we had defined three conditions uh, for taking a living or, or taking a systematic review into a living mode. One is that the question is of sufficient importance to decision making. And this is exactly why the living systematic reviews uh, became a la mode during the pandemic, because policymakers has so many questions of importance to them and they wanted quick answers. 
The second condition is that the certainty in the existing evidence is low or very low, uh, meaning that adding new evidence will likely or potentially improve the certainty of the evidence. And three is that there is new research evidence in the pipeline. The how is, you know, this is one representation of the how. You don't have to worry about the details. I'm just trying to show that it could be a very complex process to conduct uh, living systematic reviews. So the pandemic was really a stress test for the evidence synthesis community, uh, similar to many other communities like the trialist community, the guideline methodologist community, uh, and the policy makers. So how did the evidence synthesis community respond? Uh, so uh, they responded by deploying many of the tools that have been developing for a while, like network meta-analysis, artificial intelligence, crowdsourcing. Uh, they responded with the rapid methodology because when the pandemic hit, the policymakers needed quick answers. So we uh, used the rapid systematic review methodology, but we also used the living. And the living helped us because there was a deluge of information. There was information coming out on a regular basis. We, we needed the living process to make sure that the evidence synthesis is updated. So yes, living evidence synthesis were essential for the success of living guidelines. And without living evidence synthesis, we could not deliver on living guidelines. And there were many living guidelines during the pandemic developed by uh, organizations like the World Health Organization, but many other professional societies trying to advise uh, clinicians and public health uh, workers uh, in terms of how to deal with the pandemic. However, the living evidence synthesis have not reached their full potential. Uh, and I'll give you some data about this. We recently published this paper about uh, the life and death of living systematic review. Uh, this study was not restricted to COVID-19 uh, living systematic reviews, uh, but many uh, of the published reviews or included reviews addressed the pandemic. Just to give you an idea about the methodology, you could see here that in terms of the availability of the protocol, uh, almost uh, a third or a little bit than a third of the living systematic reviews did not have a protocol mentioned or reported. Uh, more than 30% of the living systematic reviews did not assess the certainty of the evidence. Um, more than half did not use grade tables, which are standardized tables to present the statistical information along with the certainty of the evidence, and only 4% engaged stakeholders. So these are uh, kind of indicators that the methodology was not as optimal as it could have been. When you look at the peer review process, looking at the percentages, uh, about half of the protocols were peer reviewed, but then the percentages go lower for what we call the base version of the living systematic review, which is the first version that is published. 0% indication of peer review for uh, the partial updates. And when we had full updates, which is a fuller report of the living systematic review, it was also a third for which we had evidence of peer review. Interestingly, when we explored how reliable was the update in terms of sticking to the planned period to update. So we calculated the ratio of the actual period to update over the planned period to update. Uh, and there was variability in the planned period for update, but as you can see that that ratio was very close to one, meaning that whatever they promised in terms of how frequently they would update, they were able to deliver maybe with a slight delay, I would say 12% delay in terms of period of update. And I would say that's very impressive. But this is for the actual updates. What we analyzed next was the time period since the last update. So since the last published update. And when we did the ratio of uh, the how much time had elapsed since the last update over the planned period of update, we've seen about more than doubling of the period, meaning that 
if they had promised that they would uh, update within, let's say, three months, uh, since the last update, on average, the the period has that had elapsed was more than double of that time. To uh, to make it maybe a bit clearer, uh, we have this graphical representation. So the midline is when uh, the last update was published, and each dot is the uh, one a publication of one version of each systematic review or living systematic review. Uh, so I missed to say that each line represents one living systematic review. Uh, so, and again, this line is when represents the latest updated version. So here, as I said previously, you can tell that there was a regular update of the living systematic review overall. This is where the ratio of one comes in. For most of them, there's regular update. It was very close to the planned period of update. But then for many of them, since the last update, a significant uh, period of time had lapsed without any update. Uh, and for about 40% of those living systematic reviews, three, three times the planned period of update has elapsed and no update has been published. And it's interesting that none of those living systematic reviews had any indication in the latest version that they might not update or they might have they might have to stop the updating. So the conclusion of this is that people have done really well whenever they updated, but at one point it came a time where they stopped updating without any uh, notice. This is another graph from that study that shows the quality of those systematic reviews assess with the MSTAR instrument, acknowledging that the MSTAR instrument is not designed specifically for living systematic reviews. But you could see that on many of those questions, the percentage uh, of living systematic reviews that met, met them was not very impressive. And when we stratify the results by rapid living systematic review versus non-rapid, the, the blue bars that represent the rapid show that you have lower quality for those living systematic reviews where they were conducted in the rapid mode. So the challenges are what we describe first as the living fatigue. And this is where people have kept updating on a regular basis. Then at some point, they went missing in action. And we're calling this the living fatigue. And from our uh, own experience, we could tell that you know, people just get, uh, you know, um, kind of sick of that living systematic reviews, lots of work. They had diverted their attention from other projects and they need to go back to those projects. So this is the living fatigue. And then as we've shown, there's a problem or a challenge in maintaining the quality of those living systematic reviews. The other challenge that we've seen is that the flow of evidence from trialists to evidence synthesizers to guideline developers was not as smooth as we wanted it to be. So as the guideline developers, uh, we would learn that a new trial relevant to one of our recommendations is published just by through a, through a, um, a press release. And, you know, press releases are very uh, flashy, big news, big impact. And then it took months until the trials were actually published for the systematic reviews to assimilate them for the guideline developers to use them in developing the recommendation. So that was a real challenge, that flow of evidence that did not allow uh, appropriate translation of the evidence into recommendations into influencing practice and actually practice was just moving ahead because as soon as uh, clinicians uh, heard the press release they were changing their practice and the recommendations came months later to catch up with the change in practice so potential solutions are first more pragmatic models of living evidence synthesis a better organization of the health universe. I'll describe this a little bit. The principles of open synthesis, which are extremely important, and better collaboration between the actors in health. 
So this is our reconception of the uh, process of living systematic review. On the top, you will see that the standard living systematic review methodology is one that is linear. You develop protocol, you run the search, you go through the different steps, analysis, dissemination. At, at one step or at one point, you might update. In the living systematic review, which you see over here, it's more of a cyclical approach. It's the coil concept where you have to go through different cycles. And these different cycles require lots of coordination in terms of the processes, understanding the evidence that is coming out, uh, publishing the evidence, and ensuring that's adequate access to that uh, latest version of the systematic reviews. And we've seen a major challenge with people landing on a version that is not the latest version. And all of these processes require improvement in the flows, requires improvement in the tools for uh, extracting the evidence, analyzing the evidence, uh, managing it, sharing it with the public, etc. In terms of the um, the what we call the evidence uh, uh, universe, um, we we published this paper uh, just uh, at the time the pandemic was starting. It was a series about the future of the evidence ecosystem series, and we talked the evidence synthesis 2.0. Uh, one of the major concepts in that paper is that currently, once new evidence is generated. It's dumped in the universe of evidence, meaning that it is put in a database um, and then, you know, with some mesh terms and some tags. And then when people have to search for evidence relevant to a PICO question, they end up with, you know, tons of literature to go through. A more ideal approach would be to organize that space or evidence space into subspaces, where as soon as a study or a publication comes out, instead of just throwing it into that large database, you would have for each PICO question or for each population, you would have a space where you would say, this is where this study fits in. So at some point, if someone would like to conduct a systematic review, they would easily go to that cell that contains all the relevant studies. And without having to do a search that is non-sensitive, they would just pick those studies and take them to the uh, next steps. So this is a work that would need you know, some technology, tools, appropriate platform to organize that space of evidence to make it more easy to search. Uh, the, the probably another important or even more important concept is the concept of open synthesis, uh, which became even more important during the pandemic. Uh, so this is a nice graph that represents all the components of evidence synthesis from open collaboration to open discovery to open methods and the availability of uh, freely accessible tools, data, open code, open access, obviously, open peer review, and then being transparent about the declarations of interest. So having these would be important. I mentioned earlier the problem that we faced during the pandemic in terms of guideline developers, in terms of having the data shared by the trialist in order to have timely recommendation generation. So having these concepts will help with that free flow of information uh, in a way that would benefit the intended population. So I'll end up by talking about the importance of collaboration between the major actors. And there are many actors. We talk about knowledge users, knowledge generation community. So these are the trialists, the knowledge, knowledge synthesis community, the systematic reviewers, the guideline community, and also the knowledge translation community. So these actors have to work together to make sure that the end goal of serving the community, uh, the society, the public, in terms of guidance is achieved. Currently, these different actors have this connected goal. And the goal is really to publish their products. Again, the example of the trialist during the pandemic, they get the uh, paper out with 
you know, significant delays. They publish it in a, uh, you know, highly cited journal, a journal with high impact factor, and they celebrate. This is the achievement. We published in journal X, and that's it. They get the credit for doing that. They don't get the credit for handing this information to this evidence synthesizers. Uh, and this is really important. So what we are calling for is that these different actors have a common goal, which is delivering the needed knowledge to inform decision making. And this is really when they can declare victory. So the trialist should be able to declare victor victory only when they make sure that their data has been delivered in, a, in the right way to inform decision making. So we've, uh, we've heard a lot during the pandemic about this is not a sprint, this is a marathon, but I would say this is a relay race. People have to work together, they have to deliver that information. And if you see that relay, that's not easy. This is where the work of um, uh, the developers of tools and processes is really important to make sure that this is happening. At this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that next time we can meet in person and discuss further how we could move things forward for the uh, good of everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eli. That was a really fascinating insight into living systematic reviews. Well, that's it for us for this week and this year. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you've had a thoroughly interesting and fascinating week. Please do continue to dive into the materials from this year and indeed all of the materials from last year as well. We hope that you continue to enjoy them and find use in them. Thanks to everyone who's taken part and helped made this happen and we look forward to seeing you in 2024. That's it for now. Bye-bye.